Good morning. So we heard from Carl and Adam a lot about where we are, what our problem is. Let's take a moment to look at how we got here and then perhaps some ideas for how we, how we can go forward in a better way. So this graph shows that increase from 1980 to 2018 in drug overdose deaths in our country. And you can see two things. One, that stark, stark increase. That's how we got to the NFL stadium uh, full, full of people. If you're an optimist, you can notice that at the, at the tail end there is starting to be, thank God, at least a slight reduction. If we look at it geographically, here on your left, you're looking at the U.S. in 2003. On your right, the U.S. in 2017. Dark red is a lot of uh, drug overdose deaths, and you can see how much darker red our country got during that time period. When we talk about opioid overdose deaths in this country, the opioid crisis, we talk about three waves. So the first wave was driven by prescription opioids. And what we're looking at here, the green line, is the increase in sales over time of prescription, uh, prescription opioids in our country. The red line is the increase in deaths. And the blue line is the increase in admissions for the treatment of addiction. And what you can see is that from 1999 to 2010, those three lines went up together, essentially in parallel. This shows all three waves. So the first wave is that line going up in 1999. That's the prescription opioids going up. In around 2010, the second wave goes up. That's heroin. What happened then is in 2010, 2011, we started to decrease opioid prescribing in this country. And there was also the introduction of some tamper-resistant formulations, such as the gummy formulation of OxyContin, that made it harder to uh, tamper with OxyContin. At that point, patients who were already suffering from opioid use disorder, from addiction, really made a shift to heroin. It was more accessible, it was less, uh, less expensive for them, but 80% of the people who were taking heroin had started with prescription opioids. Now that's either prescription opioids that were prescribed to them or prescription opioids that were diverted and they got their hands on. The third wave is all the way to the right, that's the synthetic opioids. That's essentially illicit fentanyl and uh, fentanyl analogs. The reason for that is that fentanyl is entirely synthetic, so it's very inexpensive to make. It's very simple to make. You can make it in any chemistry lab in China or in Mexico. And fentanyl is very, very potent. So a small package of fentanyl that can easily be smuggled, be, can be sent through the mail and is hard to detect, etc., can still be sold to a lot of people. So that's where the illicit uh, fentanyl became the third wave. But let's go to the start. Where did the first wave come from? Well, Purdue Pharma and others were selling uh, OxyContin, long-acting uh, oxycodone, and other long-acting opioids for cancer pain. And they realized there are a lot more people out there with non-cancer pain, back pain, hip pain, knee pain. And they wanted to, to get that bigger market. So how did they do it? Well, you can read here, Purdue Pharma funded more than 20,000 pain-related educational programs through direct sponsorship or financial grants. They gave financial support to the American Pain Society, the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the Federation of State Medical Boards, the Joint Commission, pain patient groups, et cetera. And I'm, I'm here speaking to you as an academic pain medicine specialist, and certainly there were plenty of academic pain medicine specialists who participated in this. Now, many people who participated, mind you, were driven by good intentions. Pain had been recognized as being somewhat undertreated in the 1980s. They wanted to do a better job. But industry definitely saw a big market and a big opportunity to increase profits. Let's look at sort of how, how they did that. This is a five-sentence letter to New England Journal that was published in 1980. It was researchers at Boston Medical Center. They simply looked at about 40,000 patients who were admitted to Boston Medical Center. About 12,000 of them got an opioid during their inpatient stay, typically after a surgery. And they could identify four of them who developed addiction. And they published that. They did nothing more, nothing less. Purdue Pharma and others made sure that that five-sentence letter was cited over 600 times. When that five-sentence letter was cited, the, sentence, the citations were grossly misrepresentative. So this pain patient population with no abuse history is literally at no risk for addiction. 
Medical evidence overwhelmingly indicates that properly administered opioid therapy rarely, if ever, results in accidental addiction. So they took it from a patient who's inpatient, gets a couple of days of opioids after a surgery, and you don't see a lot of addiction, and stretched it to if we see a patient in our office who's had five years of back pain and we start him or her on several years of opioids, don't worry. No, no risk there, because here's the, here's the evidence. Well, it wasn't just the pharmaceutical companies, the professional societies, the academic pain medicine specialists, etc. cetera. JCO contributed to this problem. In 2001, they famously introduced pain as the fifth vital sign. CMS added three pain, patient, uh, three pain questions to their HCAPS patient surveys. Those HCAP patient surveys tie to hospital reimbursement. So here are two of the questions. During this hospital stay, how often was your pain well controlled? Uh, how often did the hospital staff do everything they could to help you with your pain? So when you tie certain metrics to whether a hospital gets its accreditation and whether a hospital gets uh, the level of reimbursement that they want, that's going to drive behavior, okay? The FDA contributed to this problem. FDA typically required 12-week trials for long-acting opioids. But of course, the question with these medications is not, how's my patient going to be doing in 12 weeks? It's, how's my patient going to be doing in one year, in five years? Zohydro is a long-acting formulation of hydrocodone that had no tamper-resistant uh, technology in it. So the FDA's own advisory board said, don't approve it. It doesn't have any tamper-resistant uh, formulation. The FDA approved it nonetheless, uh, over, against uh, the recommendation of their advisory board. The DEA also contributed to this problem. So in this country, the DEA sets the quota for opioid production every year. And what we're looking at here is the DEA's production quota for oxycodone from 1993 to 2018. And what you can see is that even in the years when the opioid crisis was widely, widely recognized for the crisis that it is, DEA did not limit the production of oxycodone. And during this time period, the staffing of DEA to address these sort of issues actually went down. They were understaffed and their staffing reduced if you look across 2013, 14, et cetera. So if those are some of the things that led to this crisis, what do we do? Uh, in this sort of format, I always like to think, you know, look, I'm, I'm going to be in clinic on Monday. I think a lot of us are going to be in clinic on Monday, Tuesday, et cetera. So, so what do we do now? I think we look at the evidence. This is the SPACE trial. Randomized controlled trial showed that at one year, pain functional outcomes for patients with chronic low back pain or hip and knee pain from osteoarthritis were no different between opioid and non-opioid medications. So if the problem is too many prescriptions, the solution there is less prescriptions. Wherever possible, use acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen, physical therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Use opioids more judiciously based on that evidence. This is a graph showing data showing that if a patient's initial opioid prescription is longer than five days, the chances that that patient is still on opioids at one year and three years go up dramatically. So if the problem is too many days prescriptions, what's the solution? Fewer days. Now, how many days is the right answer? That's going to depend on the details of that patient's case. That's going to depend on what kind of surgery. But in general, trend towards the lower number of days is what that's telling us. This is data showing us that when the opioid dose goes up, the risk of opioid overdose goes up dramatically. So if the problem is doses that are too high, the solution is to use the lowest possible dose and to avoid escalating that dose wherever possible. We saw a couple of excellent presentations about weaning. I'll tell you our, the way that we recommend weaning a patient who's on chronic opioids. We say take their total daily dose, their total morphine milligram equivalents per day, decrease that by 10% every one to two weeks. When you get to 30% of what you started at, then decrease that amount by 10% every one to two weeks until the patient's off. If you do it that way, the patient is not going to get any physical withdrawal. If the patient is struggling as you do that, 
That to us is an indication that we're looking at addiction, opioid use disorder, and we think very strongly at that point about referring the patient to addiction medicine. So if I can leave you with one take home here, I would say that opioids are our strongest pain medications. There are some patients who do very well on them. There are certainly some circumstances where we, we have to use them, where it's appropriate to use them. So the answer is not always no, but it certainly is not always yes. Like everything in medicine, the key is going to be looking at the risk and benefit of this therapy for our patient, whether that be opioids, non-opioids, an intervention, a surgery, et cetera. And when in doubt, judiciousness is going to serve us well. Thank you very much.